And welcome to UCN Live. I'm Steve Kim, and I'm joined by the man that's come out of hiding, Tommy <laughs> Jim Hoffa Lur. So I'd like to be back. It's good. I tell you, after Saturday night with the announcement, the official announcement of uh, Canelo versus Triple G, it uh, doesn't really get any better than that. You saw that. You saw it all written on uh, Gennady's face that night when he was in the ring. He finally, I think that's when he finally thought, okay, this fight is actually happening. You know, we signed the contract that week. We had most of the terms worked out before that, but. Uh, even with a signed contract, he didn't want to go, or he wasn't sure about going to Vegas because he didn't want the same thing to happen as it did last year. And, and when he was in the ring, when Max Kellerman was there, when they were playing his walkout music, when Canelo was talking to him, it's like, I think it finally sunk, sunk in that the fight, is, his dream fight is actually happening. Tom, I joke that every time you go underground like Jimmy Hoffa, something <laughs> is cooking in the brewing. kitchen. <laughs> yeah, when you, when you went underground, when you went off the grid, yeah. Did you get in your own mind that, hey, we're going to land this plane? Did, did you get the feeling uh, then about two, three weeks ago? Plus we had that whole so Billy Joe Saunders nonsense, you know. I mean, there, there, we were trying to do a fight in Kazakhstan. It was, uh, you know, that Jake was fight won 12 rounds. It was very competitive for both guys. I think that fight didn't hurt, you know, as far as uh, finalizing this deal also, where a lot of people thought that, you know, Gennady isn't Superman. He is human, where he's not going to knock out everyone that gets in the ring with him. Um, even though I knocked down uh, Danny. You know, then uh, moving into the uh, Canelo fight, it just made more sense uh, because Gennady couldn't fight in June. Uh, it would have been too soon for me. He would have literally had to go back in the training camp two weeks after the Jacobs fight, which is just, just, just wasn't realistic. And then it just uh, really paved the way to finalize the deal with Oscar and Eric and, and Golden Boy. And we had most of the points. Uh, worked out and then like I said we finalized the deal when I got back from the Klitschko fight at Wembley Stadium against Anthony Joshua another tremendous fight but uh, when I got back from that that's when we actually finalized the deal. Go back to the night of March 18th Gennady Golovkin wins a unanimous decision but he did not dominate there's a perception that he looked quote unquote vulnerable do you no, think no, he was exposed remember? exposed okay whatever <laughs> word you want to use with that said do you believe that the Golden Boy Brass and the Brain Trust of Saul Canelo Alvarez looking at that fight really at that point said, you know what, let's make this fight. Do you think it convinced him to push this over the goal line? I always had the feeling that he wanted to because uh, all the discussions, I mean, I had so many discussions with Eric Gomez um, and I never once got the sense that they didn't want to do it. It was just a matter of uh, agreeing on the terms and making concessions on both sides. We naturally made more concessions on our side just to get the fight, but um, with that being said, it, it didn't hurt that Gennady uh, didn't knock out his 24th opponent in a row. So um, I think it maybe it might have sped up the process somewhat. Um, they wanted to get it done before the Chavez fight um, in an ideal situation. You know, you had the whole Mayweather-McGregor thing floating out there. HBO was really pushing, you know, if you sign the fight, if you can announce it. You can cement the uh, September 16th date, which is the optimal date for, for this type of a fight. And so that's what, uh, there was uh, you know, pressure on both sides and, and we, finally, we finally got it done. Tom, I remember about a year ago or so, we did a Facebook Live at the old studios yep. for TV4. The one and that, you, that was your highest rated show. You yes, saw. it was yeah. by far. It was like the <laughs> MASH finale, okay? Now, I remember you announced, I think against your will, that, that Canelo fight at this point was not going to happen. Yeah, he tricked me on that one. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> you, you, no, hold on. No, I didn't. Were you ever discouraged throughout this process? Look, naturally, we would have liked to have fought Canelo last year when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when he fought uh, Khan. The idea was he could fight Amir Khan and then it would lead to a bigger fight after that. But you know, having only to wait one year. I mean, Oscar was right in the sense that naturally Gennady would have wanted to fight for the title as soon as possible. He would have wanted to fight for the title two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but Oscar was right in the sense that if you wait a year, you know, look, then uh, Gennady sold out the O2 in London against Kell Brook. He sold out MSG again against uh, Danny Jacobs, and the fight is definitely a lot bigger now than it would have been last year. So, you know, he was right in that, and it just makes it a, overall a much bigger promotion, much bigger financial package for both fighters. You know, Canelo and uh, Chavez, I understand they broke a million buys uh, on their pay-per-view. So if they broke a million buys on that pay-per-view, imagine the fan base that Triple G brings to Canelo's, you know, proven 
uh, fan base on, on both ticket sales and uh, on pay-per-view, and I just think that becomes a monster promotion. Tom, last year in speaking to Abel Sanchez, in fact, it was before the Jacobs fight, he said the Jacobs fight really rejuvenated him, that last year he sensed that Gennady was getting a little bit frustrated, mm -hmm. maybe even bored with the sport. Did you ever sense that? I did. Not, not as in tune as Abel did, you know, because mm -hmm. he sees him up there in training, he sees the motivation. I mean, Gennady's always in tremendous shape, but it was taking him a little bit more convincing, okay, you know, uh, this is the right type of fight for you. You know, he was very frustrated last year when the Canelo fight didn't happen. When we couldn't do the unification fight with Saunders, you know, we were talking about going to the UK to, to, to get that last title that he mm -hmm. was uh, looking for. Uh, that didn't happen, then the Eubank fight didn't happen, and so he was just like, you know, what do I gotta do to get people to fight me? And uh, that's when Brooks stepped up to the, plate, to the plate. We have a lot of respect for what Kel Brook did. He's got a tremendous fight with Errol Spence coming up, but uh, you know, Eddie Hearn was able to get that fight done. Literally, it took him two hours uh, for, uh, for Kel Brook to agree to the same exact terms. It took us two days to sign that agreement. We, we just switched, you know, Eubank Jr. to Kelbrook, and, and then the agreement was signed, and then he went to the O2. But, you know, it was still, it wasn't like that big challenge. It was great, you know, headlining in, in London, opening up a new market for him. The UK boxing fans are, are you know, the UK, the boxing in the UK now is, is, is the, the hottest market going, you know, selling out you know, Wembley Stadium and, and uh, the O2 on a regular basis. So uh, that was, in that sense, it was intriguing, but uh, Gennady really sensed from the Danny Jacobs fight, you know, Danny's a, a, a bigger guy than he is. Um, he's got great combinations. He had a tremendous amateur career. Gennady, you know, Gennady is a student of the sport. He knows all the solid amateurs, all mm -hmm. the top amateurs, and he respected Danny. He said he was the best amateur from the East Coast at that time. And uh, he respected his amateur career, what he's accomplished, um, you know, and, and Danny was coming off, I think it was either 11 or 12 knockouts in a row himself. So, you know, you had two big punchers going in there. Um, physically, he was bigger, longer reach, and, uh, you know, posed some matchup problems uh, for Gennady. Steve Kim here at the TV4 studios, UCN Live. Tom Loeffler joins us right now, Managing Director of K2 Promotions, talking about the September 16th showdown. It's done, it's consummated. Uh, Gennady Golovkin will take on Saul Canelo Alvarez. Going back to the June 10th at the World Expo with Kazakhstan, yep. I, it, it seems to be a once in a lifetime thing. Let's face it, the World Expo is probably never gonna go back to Kazakhstan. It's the biggest event in the history of their country, yeah. Bypassing that date, how much did it grease the skids for September 16th becoming a done deal from Golden Boy's perspective? There was never an ultimatum. It was never if you fight in June, you can't fight in September, but it certainly made the promotion a lot easier to plan. I mean, right now we're talking about a promotional tour probably sometime in June. You know, um, if he had fought June 10th, that would have all been pushed back. Uh, certainly Oscar and Golden Boy wanted to, to start promoting the fight, announcing the fight as early as possible. Um, so, it, again, it wasn't one of those things where it's like if you don't fight in June, we'll make the deal for sure, or if you do fight in June, it's going to cancel the deal. But, it, it, again, just like with the Danny Jacobs fight going 12 rounds, mm -hmm. the fact that they didn't fight in, in June uh, didn't hurt the situation. So I think everything just kind of came together. Once I told Eric he's not fighting, that sped up the process, and that allowed us, again, when he wasn't going to fight in June, then it allowed us to, to shoot for this May 6th date to announce the fight. Tom, I saw you yesterday at the Golden Boy offices meeting with the brass. There was this big table. At, at a meeting like that, what exactly is discussed? <laughs> I mean, uh, a big uh, fight like this. Uh, luckily, we've got a long time uh, to actually plan things out, to go through all the different ven uh, offers from the venues. That's the next question everyone's uh, asking, like, where it's is gonna the fight going to be? Gonna be? Question, yes. Where do I have to book my hotel room? Where do I have to book my flights? Some people, I think, are going to book flights to Dallas <laughs> and to, to Las Vegas and, and maybe even New York. MSG is very interested in hosting that fight also. So, um, you know, there's just so many logistics, uh, the rollout of the PR tour, um, you know, all the promotional pieces, the shoulder programming with HBO, the marketing plan, um, the different interviews, where the guys are going to, I mean, just so many uh, things that go into the nuts and bolts of planning a huge promotion like this that uh, you really want to get out early. We, we have a good relationship with Golden Boy. We planned the co-promotion mm -hmm. with Lemieux. That's where Gennady, you know, had the multiple titles. David had the IBF title, and that, that sold out Madison Square Garden. That was a great promotion. It worked out very smoothly. 
the cooperation on, on that promotion. This time, you know, Canelo, uh, we're Golden Boy's the lead promoter. Even though Canelo doesn't have the titles, um, we conceded the fact that it's, uh, you know, Canelo's bill has the first billing. He'll have the, the choice of like, going into the ring uh, second or, you know, being announced second, things like that. But, you know, Gennady, at the end of the day, he just wanted the fight. He didn't really care, you know, all the minor details like that. He just wanted the fight and knew he wanted to know he was going to get paid uh, or compensated fairly. And, and uh, this is the type of promotion where both Canelo and Triple G, because of what they bring to the table, but it's more than just two plus two. Mm -hmm. It's like two plus two equals ten in this situation, where the chemistry yeah. of their fan bases, I mean, that's all people have been asking me about is, is uh, you know, where's the fight going to be? And you, you see it's dominating, you know, all the, the, the boxing coverage on, um, you know, the various uh, outlets, even mainstream outlets. Yeah. So that's where uh, yeah, my point is that uh, both guys, regardless of how the deal worked out, both guys will, will earn their biggest payday of their career, which is, you know, what should happen in a fight like this. Tom, you are the B-side for the first time um, and since you have handled Gennady Golovkin. You did have to give up certain things. I did read that the rematch clause that's been reported is held by Canelo <laughs> and not by you guys. Okay, I think you guys can handle yeah, that because if you win I'm, the fight, yeah, you'll I'm get not, it again. Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to yeah. confirm or deny uh, any rematch. Uh, but it is being it. reported out there. It, it, uh, it was it was reported. I don't know if it was accurate, but it was. Oh, reported. okay, very interesting. Yeah. My question is about the IBF second day weigh-in. Now, Danny yeah. Jacobs, I thought played a game that there's other belts on the line and I could bypass one belt to gain an advantage. I get the sense that Canelo, given his status in the sport of boxing, that he's bigger than belts. Do you think the same thing will happen the night of, let's say, September 15th going into the morning of September 16th? I don't know if Danny played a game. I think it was a strategy on, on their part. I think uh, they saw Lemieux did that the week before, and you saw the, the, the tremendous knockout Lemieux had against uh, Curtis Stevens. Uh, so I think it was definitely uh, strategic on their part. You can't fault them for that. They didn't break the rules. They, they didn't, uh, you know, they, they had signed to fight for all the titles and, and uh, chose at that point not to fight for the IBF title, foregoing that title in order to get, you know, a perceived advantage of not having to weigh in. Like Gennady, as a champion, had to follow all the IBF rules. and. You know, there was also an additional advantage of the New York Commission wanted to do an early weigh-in because Top Rank had the Mike Conlon show that night. They wanted to do a 9 o'clock weigh-in, so I don't know if Danny will ever get that luxury of <laughs> weighing in at 9 o'clock on Friday. That was an early weigh-in, Tom. And fighting on 11.30 mm -hmm. Saturday night and the opponent having to do the second day weigh-in. But again, that was, uh, it was all part of the, you know, how everything unfolded. But uh, yeah, I, I talked to Eric about that already, and there's some safeguards in place where it won't be an unfair advantage for one fighter. If Canelo chooses not to fight for the IBF title, mm -hmm. then, IBF, then Gennady won't unfairly be burdened by that second day weigh-in. So, I mean, not to get into, you know, details on that, but it's, you know, Canelo has the choice. If he can fight for all the titles, he can fight for one title, he can fight for none of the titles. So, and then we'll, we'll go uh, from there. Tom, I think it's clear he's not fighting for the WBC <laughs> title anytime soon. Uh, he's become the modern-day Riddick Bowe without the trash can. Oh, Gennady, uh, <laughs> Gennady likes that uh, Huichal belt. Uh, he, he actually wants to go down to Mexico and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and get that because he, he, uh, <laughs> we saw Mauricio <laughs> Zulon afterwards, and he, he actually liked that belt. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It seems to be still some friction there. Uh, but, yeah, uh, it's not official whether he's going to fight for the WC title or not. Tom, I spoke to Eric Gomez yesterday. We filmed another show, me and Doug Fisher. He did reveal that there was a percentage split, and then that, that was huge. Was your side of the belief that you just weren't, that a flat fee just was not going to get the deal done? Look, we started out, um, there, there's a couple comments on that. Again, not going too much into detail on that because we do have a confidentiality clause. Yeah. But... I mean, from the beginning, our position was both guys should get a percentage. If the fight does great, both guys should be rewarded. Yeah. If the fight underperforms, it shouldn't be uh, one side being penalized because they're, they're paying a guarantee. I think we could have gotten the fight done either way mm -hmm. with a percentage or a guarantee. We were actually very close on, the, on the going down the road of, of uh, you know, having a guarantee. But uh, when we were able to switch direction and go with the percentage route, I think... Uh, I think it's 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 really un, unlike other fighters who get uh, guaranteed uh, purses 
whether their fight performs or not. Mm -hmm. Here, if the fight does an extraordinary amount, both guys will get paid extraordinarily. If both, if the fight, if they don't go out and promote their fight, if they don't sell tickets, if they don't sell pay-per-views, if they just go into a shell in their training camp, then you know the promotion will reflect reflect that, and that's where I think. Uh, the percentage is the most fair so, split on that. So, Tom, in this promotion, <laughs> both guys will show up for the face-off? Is that what you're telling if, me? If there's a face-off, <laughs> Gennady has never missed an HBO uh, appointment. So, look, he's, I, I, I put out a, a tweet on Sunday morning, you know, 9 o'clock Sunday morning, he was at the uh, Mandalay Bay doing an interview with, with Lance Pugmire at LA Times. You know, he really, Gennady, there, there's, there's, uh, there's no secret formula to the success of his career. I mean, he's a very... Uh, unique individual. He's one of those fighters that comes around, you know, you know, once in a decade or maybe two decades, where, you know, he has the punching power, he has the the likability outside the ring, he's got the exciting style inside the ring, but at the same time, he works very hard promoting his fights. He's uh, he's always giving interviews on the phone. He's setting up interviews, you know, going to Bristol, Connecticut, the ESPN, or or now in in L.A. at the ESPN studios. Um, does all the obligations that HBO asks of him, and and uh, there there's a reason why he's become, you know, one of the most marketable fighters in the sport because of all the work that he puts in, not only in the ring, in the gym, but also outside, and also with all the sponsors that he's able to attract. Well, Tom, I think a lot of kudos have to go to you, though. I, I You had a vision, you had a dream, where you said, I could make this happen with a Kazakh fighter yeah. reaching the age of, of 30. A lot of people didn't believe that yeah. vision. <laughs> I, I may have been one of them. Ago. I still remember it was the Saturday of the first or second Bradley Pacquiao fight at Wolfgang Pucks, yeah, and right. you invited yeah. a round table yeah. of writers. I was late, because yeah. quite frankly, I, I had too much vodka the night Those before. Were the few steak dinner, yeah. the steak breakfast that you uh, yeah. that you missed. There was only a glass of orange <laughs> juice left. Boy, it was good orange juice. But I remember you telling me, Steve, I could make this guy into a pay-per-view star. That's yeah. the goal. And I'll be honest with you, I thought it was a very daunting task. You did a lot of press lunches out of your own pocket for fights involving Gabe Rosado. Yep. Uh, this really was like grassroots movement. Even from Proxa. The, yeah. Even Proxa, we stopped in New York to do a media lunch when virtually not many people knew Gennady, I had to invite them just based on my relationship with them and, and you know maybe five or six writers showed up in New York on the way up to uh, Turning Stone. Yeah, and you're taking us to places like Morton's and <laughs> you're taking us yeah. to good places too. Yep. Yep. With that said, the effort that you've put in and yep. not to just be a television packager and to stick him in a casino to take financial risks, how much personal vindication is there for you that you've made it? You know, there was never any guarantees. Uh, I saw the formula that we did with the Klitschkos, you know, where uh, Vitaly fought here at Staples Center. Uh, they both fought in Madison Square Garden. They both had a tremendous uh, fan base as far as uh, being able to sell tickets. And I figured with Gennady, Gennady really was committed to fighting in the U.S. His mm -hmm. training camp was here in Big Bear. He moved his family to Santa Monica, to Los Angeles area. Um, and he was committed to fighting here, so I knew what we did with the Klitschko's, we could probably take even a step further by someone who's actually committed to, to fighting here. And I gotta say, I gotta give uh, Madison Square Garden, you know, Joel Fisher, Sal Federico, all the guys over there, a tremendous amount of credit because when I first uh, sent an email to Sal and said, we signed a Triple G, he's an undefeated WBA did he know middleweight who he was? champion. Well, no, he knew, yeah, okay. Sal knew. And I gotta give him credit. He's like he saw it right away. You know, the vision was to build him up, to have him fight at the theater a couple times, uh, five thousand seat venue. And then uh, after he fought there twice, he fought uh, Rosado there, and then he fought Curtis Stevens, and then we moved him into the big arena with Daniel Gio. Mm -hmm. And whenever you open up the big arena with a guy from Kazakhstan against a guy from Australia, <laughs> you know, there's some financial risk there. And uh, Gennady wasn't that proven ticket seller yet, but we felt that that fight, Gio being a former champion. Um, that fight was big enough where we can open up the arena. It didn't sell out, but it did It did good to justify opening it up, and it was a step-by-step -step process. Every time he had a bigger fight in a bigger arena, he got more, more press, and it just was the next stepping stone for the, for the next fight. And now, whether he goes to MSG, whether he goes to the Forum, whether he goes to London, he sold out every arena within the last two years, and now that's what I think is the stepping stone for a huge promotion like this. If we do go to a, a, a big outdoor uh, stadium like uh, mm -hmm. Cowboy Stadium, well, Tom, uh, that's you've a got perfect, a lot of tickets. That's a perfect segue to this question that I'm, I'm 
think is paramount to a lot of boxing fans. September 16th, I believe, is the biggest event in boxing. I think it's probably the biggest since May 2nd, 2015. Agree. You were there a couple of weeks ago when 90,000 people saw in yeah. Wembley Stadium a great heavyweight battle. Yeah. It, it seems like a silly rhetorical question as it relates to you and Golden Boy picking a venue for this fight. Will it be just about the money? The, the financial part is going to play a significant role, but I don't think it's only about the money because a fight like this is really a historic fight. And when you, if you can go, and I'm not downplaying Vegas at all because Gennady's never fought in Las Vegas. That's always been one of his dreams to fight in Las Vegas. This would be the perfect fight to go there. You have all the celebrities, all the VIPs, all the you know people that fly into Vegas for these type of events. You know Tyson fought there, Mayweather fought there, all the you know many huge events have taken place in Las Vegas. At the same time, when you, you know, as you alluded to, the, the Klitschko versus uh, Joshua fight, uh, you know, at Wembley Stadium, when you see 90,000 people, you know, we've done Klitschko fights in, in soccer stadiums in Germany, 40,000, 50,000 seat soccer stadiums, and those were huge events. But when you see 90,000 people at Wembley, if we could do something like that, whether it's Cowboy Stadium or or as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of offers coming in, but, you know, Jerry Jones invited Gennady last year uh, to one of the games and Canelo fought there. He sold 50,000 tickets there. If Canelo can sold, sell 50,000 tickets against Liam Smith, I'm sure that we can sell 90,000, 100,000 tickets with, uh, with this fight just from the reaction we've gotten with the fans. How much input will you have? We know Golden Boy Promotions is the lead promoter. Do you have a say in this? Absolutely. It's, it's a co-promotion and as I said, you know, we get along well. You know, there were no issues. You know, there was no fighting, no, no bickering over over the financial uh, part of the Lemieux fight when we did the co-promotion. They have the same philosophy we do. We're willing to invest money in the marketing, in the promotion, in order to make it a more successful event. You know, whether it's the undercard fights, you have to invest in the undercard fights mm -hmm. to give uh, you know, a good value for, for the fans, not only for the main event, but also for the overall show. Um, so it, it won't be 100% uh, based on uh, revenue, although that'll be the driving force. Right. Um, but it is a co-promotion, so we'll, we'll we'll go through all the offers with, with Eric and, and Oscar. They're, they are the lead promoter, and they'll have the final decision. But uh, again, I, I think we'll be on the same page when we go through all the different offers. Tom, what's the most exotic location or venue <laughs> that has thrown their hat? I understand New Orleans, and I'm assuming yeah. that's the Super Bowl, uh, Super Dome. Super Dome. Yeah. Um, you're saying Dodger Stadium now? Dodger Stadium in. yesterday expressed interest. Yeah, and and look, Gennady is throwing out the pit, the first pitch there. Uh, uh, twice at Dodger Stadium now, so um, he likes going there with his son. With the uh, so, it's really uh, this type of promotion. The fun thing about this type of promotion is we're not struggling. We're not begging, you know, venues like okay, we need to sell this fight. I mean, they're basically coming to us saying this is the fight we have wanted to host or will want to host because they realize the fan bases um, and, and just the the international flavor of this. Gennady's fights are, are, are seen in, in uh, so many different uh, international countries when you combine that with, uh, with a fight like this with Canelo. I mean, the, not only the, the stadiums or the arenas that have contacted us, but also the international broadcasters already you know, positioning themselves to show the fight internationally. So it really becomes, just like the, the uh, fight with Anthony Joshua and Vladimir Klitschko, it was a really international sporting event. Mm -hmm. That's what this is going to be, just in a different setting here based in the U.S., but certainly uh, uh, an international event. And that's, that's really what I think Gennady brings back is the definition of a world champion. He doesn't fight in just one city mm -hmm. or one state or one, one venue or one coast one, yeah. or, or one venue. And, and uh, I think that's another thing that's really helped his, uh, his marketability. Uh, you know, when he went to China, he had a ton of Chinese fans coming up to him and wanting his autograph. And that, that really kind of surprised me because we weren't sure what type of reaction he would get there. But his fight, every fight is shown, you know, in, in, you know, in, in over 100, 100, I think it's over 120, 130 countries now. And it's really uh, uh, an impressive statement. Tom, regardless of where the venue is, when will that decision be made? When will it be announced? I think within the next couple of weeks, you know, we'll sift through the uh, through the offers. Uh, we want to make the right decision. We don't want to rush into anything. Naturally, you know, if we narrow it down to two or three venues, then we'll have to see, you know, who's really willing to go the extra mile. Whether mm -hmm. it's marketing the fight, whether it's you know, uh, putting in uh, any additional value. It's not just dollars. 
and since from the ticket sales, it's, it's all the, you know, the additional value that goes into it. You know, when you have a big pay-per-view fight like this, you also want your strategic partners, not only your sponsors or not only HBO, but you also want uh, the venue, you know, marketing the fight as well. So there's a lot of different uh, functions that goes into making a decision to, for the venue. Tom Loeffler here at the UCN Live TV4 yes. studios in El Segundo, California, talking about the big date, September 16th. We go to the Twitter timeline to the <laughs> Ask uh -oh. Tom section. Okay, I filtered these out, Tom. We're good. Yeah, did you? Yes, don't worry. These are okay. Here's one from Weba E. K9, ask Tom if Gennady Golovkin plans to move up in weight. Any big pay-per-view that might create a buzz if Golovkin moves up? You know, we, we've uh, said uh, all along, if it was the right fight at 168, he would consider moving up. We tried to do the Chavez fight at 168 uh, a couple years ago. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that's when uh, Chavez was going through his issues with top rank and, and the promotional side, so we weren't able to, to finalize that deal, even though Bob made him, uh, you know, at that point was uh, a significant offer. That would have been a very high profile fight. Uh, I talked to Eddie Hearn a number of times, you know, about uh, Gennady going to the UK fighting Carl Froch at 168, but that never materialized. Um, you know, Carl was right, you know, after that uh, second growth fight, he mm -hmm. hasn't fought again. So, he, you know, you can't, you can't uh, fault him for that. If he's retired, he's retired. You can't, like, force him to come out of retirement. Hasn't kept him from talking, though. Yeah, he always, he always, <laughs> says, <laughs> always says he's too big and too strong for Triple G, but then he <laughs> never, never follows up on it. So I don't know. It's kind of like a, a balancing act there for him. But, you know, I mean, we have respect for what Carl's accomplished in his career. He held the record before, uh, before uh, Joshua fought Klitschko. He held the record at uh, Wembley Stadium for, for 80,000 people, and, and we broke that by uh, 10,000 people. So... Um, you know, those were really the two fights that were like mega fights at the time that would have made sense. Um, right now, um, you know, with the fight with Canelo, he still would like to unify at some point, you know, if we can do that, if he's successful with Canelo. Um, so it just depends on what would be available. If he's successful in September, what would be available to him at 160 or if uh, at 168 there's a big fight that emerges, but uh, that's still the same answer to the question is, if it's a major fight, a mega fight, then he would consider moving up. Here's one from Madavia Golovkin. <laughs> Will the White Stripes perform Seven Nation Army for Gennady Golovkin as the intro for the Canelo fight? And was that negotiated out? Was that one of the concessions? You couldn't use your theme song? Well, it'll definitely be the, the song that he walks into the ring. I mean, okay. the fan reaction, when they hear those first few bars, they know the guy's gonna come out somewhere from the arena. Yeah. You know, we've kind of had him coming out from different places, had him walking around at StubHub. We had him walk around the whole How about a zip line? He comes in from the scoreboard of Dallas. How about that one? You know, we, we could get creative <laughs> on that. I know uh, Hamed flew in on a magic carpet I one was time. Yes, Hub, uh, it was against, actually, I think it was the Barrera fight. I remember he did that for one of the fights. Could he came been, in yeah, from a zip line. The fights, yeah. so, um, you know, we'll, we'll get creative. We always want to put on a great show for the fans. You know, that's always a little bit of a, a balancing act. Also, when you're walking through the fans, you mm. know, he loves his fans. And, mm. you know, but you're, when you're getting ready to get into the ring, you know, it's always also somewhat of a security issue. So it's a little bit of a balancing act there. But uh, he always li likes uh, having very unique uh, ring entrances. And I'm sure, you know, together with Golden Boy, we'll figure out something for the entrances of uh, Triple G and, uh, and Canelo. Here's one from Andy Finlayson, shuffling the deck just a little bit. What's the chances Klitschko, Vladimir, takes that rematch with Joshua if you were going to give a percentage? You know, it's hard to say. Uh, I watched the fight literally just yesterday uh, on, the, on, uh, on TV, and, and I actually, <laughs> live, you know, you're always like kind of caught up in the moment. But uh, I hadn't seen Vladimir bouncing on his on his feet like that, you know, for for so long. I mean, he looked like he was 25, mm -hmm. not uh, not uh, 40. So, what was the mood in the locker room? Because I thought he fought a valiant fight. I think this is still one of his best fights of his career. As you're there with your fighter afterwards, what was the mood from Vladimir? You know, it's always uh, if, you know naturally if you win, that everyone's celebrating, and you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, it wasn't really a somber mood because, look, he put on a tremendous performance. You know, m many fans said it's the best performance of his career. He gained mm -hmm. a lot of new fans. A lot of fans respect him a lot more because of that, because of that performance. 
you know, he had some some performances that weren't the most exciting, like the Tyson Fury or the Jennings fight, and uh, some people were getting down on, on his style. And, and when he stood there toe to toe with Joshua and really looked like the younger, mm -hmm. the younger fighter with the combinations and the hand speed, and you know, naturally Joshua can punch. I mean, they can both punch. Yeah. And Vladimir dropped him for the first time in, in, in his career in, in, uh, with, with Joshua. And, um, you know, when I saw it on TV, I really saw, it. you know, he was really outboxing him for the most part of the fight, except he got, he got caught mm -hmm. early. I think it was like the fifth round. And then that monster uppercut that Joshua, you know, came back with, he got a second win and then landed it. I think that was in the 10th or 11th round. I mean, that, I don't know how he even got up from that, but. Um, Tom, is there a deadline for Vladimir to enforce that rematch? There is, uh, but again, you know, Vladimir is going to be the one that makes the decision. It's, it's his uh, decision to make. Um, if he wants to enforce uh, that uh, rematch clause, then, then that'll be the next fight. Uh, if he chooses to retire, you know, he'll be a, a surefire Hall of Fame uh, uh, career. So, you know, we'll, I told him we'd re support him whichever way he goes. I know the fans. Would love to see the rematch. I'd love to see the rematch. Eddie Hearn probably would like to see the rematch. Yeah. So you know, we'll see what he uh, what he decides to do. Here's a question from F your feelings, and we clean that up. There are kids <laughs> out there watching. Um, will Gennady ever fight in Texas, excluding a possible Canelo fight? Oh sure. I mean the uh, the reception we got when we just went uh, for the Cowboys game. Um, we went to San Antonio. We had a, a media lunch there, and then somehow it got out that he was there at. Uh, I think it's me, Piace, down oh, there. Oh, sorry about that, Tom. That, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was like 300 <laughs> fans like lined out, uh, or hundreds of fans lined up uh, out the out the door. And you know, to his credit, again, going back to marketing himself and his career, he signed the autographs, took photos, and, and was literally there for an hour and a half, just uh, you know, unexpectedly, um, uh, you know, uh, paying his respects to his fans and and. and uh, you know, endearing him to to his fans, and that's that's all part of uh, building uh, a superstar. I'm sure if he would have left, and and there would have been this huge line of fans waiting and been disappointed, you know, some of them would have been like, oh, we don't we don't need to support Triple G. But you know, when you have that personal contact, that's what really seals the deal for you know a lifelong fan. Here's a question from Alex Lopez: If Gennady Golovkin manages to defeat Canelo, is B.J. Saunders next? Well, he, he was, you know, he would have had the fight last year if we could have made that, uh, made that fight before, the, uh, before we made the Brook fight. Um, but is all the belts still the focus? It's, uh, I mean, it's always been his dream to, to fight for all the belts. Um, you know, if he beats Canelo, he's at, he definitely is at a different stage in his career. You know, just on the, the publicity alone for this fight, just on the announcement, <laughs> is more than he's gotten, you know, with uh, any fight uh, previously. So, um, he would still like to to fight for that uh, that last title that's eluded him. You know, I've never had a fighter, Steve, that you know has had multiple titles, a unified champion, and, and you're like begging people to get in the ring to fight him. Yeah. To, to like, here's the titles. Do you want right. to fight him? And that's really supposed to be every fighter's goal and his dream is okay. I want to fight for the titles, but okay, I don't want to fight Golovkin because I'll fight him next year. Hmm. <laughs> you know. Here's a final question from Matt Golnick. Wants to know: Does do you have any control of the undercard, or is it all Golden Boy Promotions? No, it's a it's a uh, collaboration. Also on the undercard, you know, where we'll have a slot, they'll have a slot, and then we'll figure out again, uh, you know, what the budget is and, and what's the best fights we can put in uh, for that budget, um, and hopefully we can put on. Uh, I mean, we always try to put on uh, a, a great undercard. I think we've with the, all the Triple G fights. The big arena fights we've had, uh, you know, some of the best undercards. You know, last the uh, last time we had uh, Chocotito and Sister Cat, mm -hmm. and we had, uh, you know, uh, Quadros was on the undercard. Ryan Martin was on the undercard. So we, you know, we always try to have. Andy Lee was on the undercard. He was actually on the even the non televised portion of the undercard. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll sit down with uh, with Golden Boy and with Eric and, and see what's the best fights we can put together for. And for here's the show. obligatory question I always get, and I'm gonna have to <laughs> give it to you: Is Jordan Brand coming out with new gear <laughs> for, for the Canelo fight? I think, I think finally we'll get some uh, some new gear from uh, Jordan Brand. I mean, it, they've been very supportive of Gennady in his career. Um, they've made Jordan T-shirts uh, before uh, for him, but I think this time that we'll see a rollout of uh, kind of like a Jordan brand Triple G line, where where the fans can uh, finally be able to to uh, 
to get their uh, Triple G gear. All right, well, Tom, good. congratulations. Thanks, you good. got the fight done. Oh, and always glad, good to be here. You know, it's glad to you have the you new, back. You got the new digs Yeah, now. yeah, the rent's yeah. a little higher here. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. Steve Kim yeah. here from El Segundo at the TV4 UCN Live Studios. Our special guest has been Tom Loeffler. So thank you for joining us. Till the next round, goodbye, everybody.